we'll repeat the news. Um, okay, so we're, we're, now, we're now live and uh, Sarah, you're on, right, Sarah? Are you there? Okay. Uh, hello, Sarah. Yep, there you are, perfect. Okay, uh, I'm, I'll kick it off and I, uh, we, Sarah and I will kick it off. I'll just read a short poem and then turn it, the mic over to Sarah and she has, has an announcement and so on, okay? Uh, welcome to the bottom of all the hearts in the world and uh, from the bottom of the mind as well to this reconstitute reading, the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. <coughs> we are proudly in our, I, I think in our 23rd year uh, of existence, uh, uh, the last three years under the current editorial team, which consists of me and and uh, Sarah Kale Marin, and uh, we're excited to welcome you to this reading. Uh, we're going to be reading for four minutes each poet, and uh, I'm going to kick it off with uh, with the following brief poem, which I wrote recently. It's called, it's called to the conceptual cats. The conceptual cats scratched at the pristine pillow, leaving it stranded, spilling out, raising the question of who then will stuff it back together. But the cat designated as clean up sifter who can work in blissful solitude, extruding, shaping the pick pocked cloth so that the next meeting of cats would be just to eat, plates full of meat, bowls of milk, agreement by unanimous vote to the conceptual cats. Welcome to the Reconstitute reading. Sarah, your call. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I may be a little absent during the reading because I'm studying for the bar exam now, which is the um, exact opposite of poetry. <laughs> um, but I thought I would read you all something from um, a new book that I'm going to be putting out on social media soon. And uh, yeah, this, this is its title poem. It's called Nothing You Build Here Belongs Here. It's a poem that Indran hates. <laughs> <laughs> no, not quite hates. <laughs> For, for for your benefit, it's called My Mountains Could Care Less About You. The book is called Nothing You Build Here Belongs Here. Um, should, I should have a link soon. Um, My mountains could care less about you. Steel structures clinging, tendrils rising, curling fingers, desperate, lonely, clutching, dry and desolate. You've buried basements and pools, trying as only the hairless do to stay cool as if heat the th is a thing you can hide from. There's no road between my breasts, blooming, tremble at the sight, at the tracing of lines, at the endless rising, rising, billowing hills, blanketed Madrian sky islands, tectonic tumbling seams of the Sierra Madre, pine oaks peak out, ancient alpine mountains of my desert sea. My arid grasslands cradle, Peaks named with expiring words, Washaka, Pinaleno, Santa Calima, Cash, Mercury, tinted dirt, hemmed edges of tan, gray, yellow, pivoting irrigation centers of gray, green, spitting out dust from 34,000 feet. Think of me as a woman, pores leaking salt, exerted, worked, squeezed, ridged, and wild, bodied peaks climbing falling, pruning the stones, years of water tumbling back to seeds. I am the desert Hera, sucking you dry, absorbing your waterless body into hers, remanding you who came to harvest, to marvel, to take, back to metal coffins you built, to the ground they were mined, for nothing you build here belongs here. Thanks, and I look forward to hearing all of you guys' poems. Thank you for gracing the Beltway with you. Thank you. Thank work. you so much, Sarah. I have to say, I, I so disliked that poem that I quoted it as an epigraph to, to one of mine that was published. So that shows you 
that hate is a form of love. Thank you, Sarah. Now, the next, we will, we will go to another point I love dearly and uh, from the Beltway region. Uh, she's coming out with a new book very soon, so keep an ear out for her work. Uh, Kristen Kowalski Farragut. Kristen, would you like to go ahead? Thanks. Thank you, Indram. Uh, so Indram and Sarah were kind enough to do a review of Escape Velocity. It should be out next week from Kelsey Books. Uh, feel free to friend me on social media and I will be sending links um, or you could just look for it if you're interested. I'm gonna start with a poem that was published in Beltway, The River. Steady before the drop that calls for falling, I fix my feet as though braced in a fight with a lover that's about to get a little violent. Proximity to precipice speaks of shattering lines and edges, but for roots that anchor earth to itself. And the way she says, shh, not like the professional shushers at children's theaters, but like the old bunny in the midnight moon. Dancing light and heady musk inhaled into memory, be unfolded later on my sick bed with the hush of the river's song. So I guess I'm saying the falls are my sister or my mother, family means solace. I will read one more. Uh, like It's New, another nod to the pandemic. Messenger video. Like It's New. The lonesome and being young sharpens. Coming of age in the 80s, the older look at lips of the younger like murder. Parents won't share a sip, even if it's alcohol. 100,000 dead and dying. An epidemic feels just like a pandemic if you're at the wrong place at the wrong time. 2 a.m. at Boot Hill Saloon Cemetery can't be the right place, except when I knew he shot crack through his veins and I might stop him. I suppose we all want to die a bit anyway, especially me when he eluded being found, invisible like viruses. Still we hunt in sideways looks at others, supposing the cleanliness of fingernails or shape of eyes might expose harbored sickness. Harbor grudges for the skateboard thrashers, always at the park sharing high fives and Pepsis. Selfish young in congregation of laughter and risk intent on killing us all, as though it's not the time of their lives. Neat with pockets to hold cell phones, not fistfuls of quarters, husbands, second husbands, cats, dogs, debt, music, and the ceaseless bad news. We hide in our homes and act as though we've never seen a plague before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Wonderful. Really excited for you for this new book, first book, which will be out uh, shortly. And uh, Kristen will read from it uh, and the return of the poetry at the Port Reading Series in Silver Spring on August 30th. So mark your calendars if you're in the Beltway region. Um, Don, if you could, uh, Jonathan Harrington is trying to get in through the link. If you could uh, respond to him. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just did. Perfect, just did. perfect. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Jonathan is connecting from Yucatan. Um, now we will hear from the wonderful poet and, and a dear friend, Mark Vincent. Mark is reading to us from Massachusetts where he edits uh, Mad Hat Press and and runs the Lit Bomb reading series, among other, among other beautiful things. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Andrew. This one uh, comes out, uh, came out in the last issue. Shifting planktons and later joy. Who hasn't drunk from the upland fountains where fresh hazel is cut each night or deep in the brook, long past migration of time, a cloud of steel wool crosses the landscape the butterflies have gone. The wolf dwells in his lair. The bear, unafraid of anything except chocolate, licks her paws. Are there any shepherds left here? Back in town, 
Latin is spoken in the tavernas and the underground chambers where light plumbing coughs and sneezes, where the scaffolding holds the mirror image, left, right, hand, left of the state. Here's Mildred in her pajamas, twisting her legs into a state of rest. There's Jonathan in his slippers shuffling through the day. And here's Jennifer, all made out in pink and red, a rose petal presenting her fair share of newspaper clippings, engorged in the cover of people or of life, in a paraphyletic of the daily news, all speed variants accounted for, held in deep esteem and sway, converged this way, up the down scale, unfettered, fitting and free, making history on her own scale. Up means down. Gravity is like pleurisy, a shriek from the future we expected and interjected, inserted and squirted into the melee, our spirit slashing for the first audience with the anointed one. Oh, the drama, the preposterous proposition when a grapnel clutches your car dripping from the river and the wind-up creature in your sights swerves to the right. Discourse, this whole affair, discursive, this whole affair. Poetry, of course, is an attack on violent forces. And one more, swarming in sugar. It begins at dawn or daybreak, whichever comes first. It begins in the downpour, puddles everywhere. We're skipping school today, roaming the streets. See, the old man is grinning. Anything can happen. Along the avenues, the leaves hop and sway. They'd do anything to raise their heads, but it's all up to the wind. For a second, nobody moves. The windows slip into their latches. Morning trembles with unease. A face sculpted in sugar, the figure of a man, when we still went barefoot, all in sugar and cream. Then there's the woman on the mountainside, a pastry with a thousand layers, a pastry with 10,000 fingers. And what of that warm egg in her hand? It begins at dawn or daybreak, whichever comes first. It begins with a spiral, waves everywhere. We're skipping work today, called in sick. See, the old man is grinning. Anything can happen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mark. And you know, Mark's hosting his Lit Bomb series. I think it's this evening. There's a reading. With no, Gary. no, actually, we don't have one this evening. Uh, oh, it's no, next week. Next, next week with Gary okay. Snyder. Yeah? Right. Right. So keep an eye out, eye out for that. Thank you, Mark. Now um, we're going to go on to um, uh, to Chad Norman. Uh, very excited to include Chad's work in this issue for the first time. Chad is spe speaking to us from Canada, where he is, I think, one of our first farmer poets. Go ahead, Chad. Take it away. Well, thank you very much for having me, Indra, and I certainly appreciate being part of a <clears throat> wonderful uh, gathering of poets here. And I'm getting the feeling that uh, we're uh, from many different parts of the world. So I can uh, get behind some of this virtual stuff, but I sure miss the live audience, I must tell you. Um, I had three poems come out in the issue and I'm very proud to be included. So I thank you for that. Um, I'm going to share two of the poems uh, of the three. The first one I'd like to uh, read is a poem that's taken from a manuscript that I'm finishing up now entitled Birder in the Cathedral. And I've been uh, very fortunate over the past 12 years to uh, uh, more or less interact and uh, visit and feed uh, six different crow families that are nearby my home. Uh, so they have been uh, the main kind of uh, beings that I've been visiting and, and staying close to uh, during the virus. So the first poem is entitled Corvid Teachings. And this is uh, dedicated for my cousin Val, who is also a great fan of the, uh, of the crows. I see the mates living closer than ever, autumn spreading rapidly. Unlike us, 
down here, asked to be distant for a reason. Few want what you in those black feathers have. So I stay away from them, the ones without wings. The second poem I'd like to share, it's from another manuscript that I'm still working on entitled, A Small Parental Forest. And it's a place that I go often and I've been very, very um, uh, fortunate to find a number of poems there. So this is a poem that uh, kind of comes on a day that I was able to uh, sit out on the front deck of my home and uh, it came uh, due to uh, some of the interactions in front of my home that have to do with the Blue Jays. This is called Beginning of the Shifts. Finally, when seated, it is about first how wonder offers a blessing, the possibility of seeing the sun thanks to a mist being sent in by something only the dawn and blue jays bring, knowing the peanuts are set in place. I, at times, feel the front deck where a new day has placed me, seemingly pull away from the home. I am again working to pay off. It is not money the Jays fly in for, beginning their shift of coming in close to fill beak after beak with one or two, if it will fit to navigate between the many jobs others given the gift of wings start as well. The benefits of no hunger. None of us for the moment unalike, able to do what we need to do. The only difference being there are no songs I sing or a flight I can manage to escape the clocks whispering. The next shift comes on, chosen just now by a chickadee in the busy beak, the future's single seed. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to read those poems. And I look forward to hearing some of you before I have to go to the garden and get my potatoes in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shed. Indran, Indran, can you ask us, all of us, where we are? Because place is such an important part of, sure. for instance, Chad's poetry. And I'm trying to imagine where he is in Canada. In, right. Indran, and I have to go. I told you that I needed to, right. to read it because my yeah. friends are beginning to get sure. here. So I have to say goodbye. No so, problem, Jaime, you're next. You're on now, you. actually, Jaime, if you'd like to read. Jaime? Okay. Go ahead. Thank I'm you. Sorry, but I, I had scheduled this a long time ago. And no, no, not to worry. Not to worry. Uh, You're right on next. So let's go ahead with you now. Thank the, you so much. Uh, I'm uh, Manrique, by the way, great poet, great novelist, long old time friend, and uh, lives in the village. He is uh, in New York. In New York. I'm Colombian, so. He's um, from Colombia, yes. Go ahead, Jaime. I hate to read in English because my accent is so thick that I'm, I don't even like really hearing my voice read, but. Anyway, so this is this is kind of a poem about an event that I took place and uh, and uh, uh, for in immigrants and this is I called it a non-fiction poem. A prestigious literary institution asked me to read my poems in a community center in a group of rest for a group to a group of recent immigrants. Fat flies emerged from the restrooms. My welcoming committee. The immigrants were waiting for me in a gloomy room that looked like a detention center on the border between abundance and death. I had not written a hopeful poem to unroll like a carpet to welcome them, but I did not want to disappoint these tired souls. They had been promised a program with me as the main attraction. There were hundreds of them from the Americas, 
from Africa, from Asia, and they did not speak my language or the language of the new country. I was determined to play the dutiful, empathetic poet. I told myself, Walt Whitman would have opened his arms to these orphan children, single mothers, the sick and starving, the persecuted of the earth. I understood these people. I had arrived to the States many years ago with my mother, my sister, and suitcase that told our history. Something urged me to confess to my public that back then I had been a terrified youth who hid my love for men from everyone except my sister, who was a few years younger than me. I understood these people, I thought, because they came from a place familiar to me, though I had never known their kind of hunger. So I read a poem about my mother, a woman born at the edge of a jungle, a descendant from enslaved people she knew nothing about. The immigrants clapped politely. I was inadequate master of ceremony, inducting them to the home they had dreamt about all their lives. Yet my poetry could not give them what they most wanted, food, shelter, a room to rest, perhaps to sleep without feeling in danger of being jailed, caged, shot, or left to die in the desert without water or a simple grave. Then an old man, put, part of a group stood up and thanked me. They were Indians from the Ecuadorian Sierras, he explained, and they had walked for a, a year to the United States, all eight of them. The old, the strong, the children, the toddler, he sat down. I was ready to offer the immigrants a bromide that might for a few seconds make them forget the fear and darkness that gripped them. A young woman rose after the patriarch has, and said, hi me, we're eight now, but we used to be nine. Thank you for telling us about you. My brother Alejandro, who left the Sierra with us, was gay too, and he was sick. I know you understand what I mean. He was too weak to walk all the way. We buried him on the side of the road in Tolteca land, and he's here with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jaime. Nonfiction poem is one of our, our very favorites in, in the issue. Thank you for Thank sending you. it in. Thank you, um, and to all of you poets, I love. Bye. Thank you. And now um, we're going to go to the expectant grandmother, but aside from that little d detail, she's a wonderful poet and an editor as well in different magazines. Um, Kashiana Singh, happy to have your work in the issue. Go ahead, Kashiana. Thank you, Andrew and Sarah. I am honored to be in the presence of this company. I appreciate having my poems in the Beltway Poetry. I'm going to try and read two, uh, one from what was published in, in the issue and uh, one from my upcoming book. It's called Woman by the Door uh, with Apprentice House Press. I'll start with uh, the one from the Beltway Poetry. It's called Your Lotus Gaze and this was written for Vice President Kamala Harris at, on the inauguration. Your lotus gaze. Your birthing is of unusual intervals, your equanimity afloat on aftermaths. Your resistance rises in imperfections, your voice is made of seasonless earth. You unpick whiteness with your shadows. You make it blush with quietness of colors. Your petals close gently over each word, each tongue a memory, bleeding azure into its veins. Your bird songs perch on upright spines, even as you wait inside pods of a thousand shimmering seeds. Each seed drowning into history, rising towards a vision of awkward blooming rising towards a vision of awkward blooming million lotus suns ready to be released. I urge her, this America, to receive, to be absent enough, to be wakened enough, to be still enough, to let her fault lines show hurt enough, to be tall enough, to be Shyamala Gopalan enough, to be innocent enough, to wear a crown made with flowers that are not flowers enough, 
to walk far, to walk deep into discomfort enough, to change enough, to be America enough, to face square and fair the frugal dawn of a moist lotus gaze present between both water and earth. The second one uh, is, I'll, I'll let you think about it later, but it's a combination of the pregnancy that's been unfolding before me uh, and what's happening in the country. Uh, and it's called, How a Woman Delivers Hope. How a woman delivers hope, she embroiders the tundra with her hushed moans breathless as a tightness tugs and untugs within her, hesitating, punctuating, she watches the air meet flesh at the outline of her being as calm unsettles into rivulets flowing. From inside of her, she pushes into beginnings and rises into endings still, patient. As the universe rises in a tumri, Swirling slogans into light, she follows other women, their flaming, screaming, breathing as her urging sinew and muscle shift, pulsing her towards life. She renews herself with a sumptuous feast of goddess light as it ebbs and flows, unfurling grit and grace, reciting the new, reciting the new, reciting the new as the midwife guides. She oozes freedom into the space between her thighs, rising into a crescendo. The protests outside grow vacant with cries. She enunciates freedom for her body and offers an exile to that which was held within hers, pushing, brimming, pushing, bearing, delivering hope into a pregnant pause. And a glistening head now emerges into the trembling hands of attempted courage, into the fragility of a land that walks barefoot, into earth men that pedal her to goddesses, into monuments that stand on quicksands, into rivers sterile for they are bleeding dry, into flags that flutter with septic infusions, into prayers of a laboring country. How a woman delivers hope. Thank you, Indra. Thank you. How a woman delivers hope. You know, Bill Clinton came from Hope, Arkansas, but Kamala Harris represents uh, hope in a different, uh, on a broader <laughs> uh, definition. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Now, uh, we're going to hear now uh, from Chile, from Santiago, Chile, the wonderful poet Pauline. Pauline Leroy, she's a painter as well and uh, conductor of a radio program there where she interviews uh, poets and, uh, and other artists. Um, she has, uh, uh, I think about eight or nine books published. I'm actually translating her most recent book, Obscene Sabiduria, uh, Obscene Wisdom. And so uh, she will read poems from that book and. I will read the translations. Go ahead, Tolin. Muchas Thank gracias. You, Jan. I say hello to all today. And <clears throat> I am in Chile, in Santiago of Chile, so far, and a very pretty uh, country here. And I want to say thank you to Beltway Poetry Magazine and all to this opportunity to read my poetry. Um, I'm going to read my poetry in Spanish and then Indran will read in English. Thank you to all, I send Hughes. The first poems, first poem. Imen natural. Vengo llegando de una vida larga, larga, muchos metros de momentos no quietos, esparcidos, torbellinos que salieron en busca de la infancia, esa lancha, ese ojo, ese sonido, manto blanco, virgen de huida y abnegada por un himen natural, a presión nuclear y embrutecida más, por siempre suave, con manos poderosas, con dientes de sables, 
barcazas cruzando un estrecho de isla y continente que fueron lentamente dando metros y metrallas a los ojos de una niña que no comprendía nada. Natural Hymen. I have come from a long life, many meters of unquiet moments, stretched out, whirlwinds that went in search of infancy, that boat, that eye, that sound white cloak, virgin of flight denied by a natural hymen with a nuclear pressure, brutalized but always smooth with powerful hands, saber-toothed barges crossing a spit of island and continent that was slowly shaped in meters and shrapnel in the eye of a girl who understood nothing. De mi tercio pelo bajan duendes con agallas magníficas. De mi tercio pelo bajan duendes con agallas magníficas. Cientos de ancianos nos comprimen, atrofian el astuto de venir. Los chillidos no se oyen, sin embargo, dentro de ti los puedo ver. En la orilla de mi mundo oceánico, los destellos se apresuran sobre mí. Tu sonrisa acaba siempre lejos, los faroles de neón ríen de la encrucijada, refulgiendo mi corazón duele con el hielo, que lo quema lentamente y no muero, porque el alma está al fondo del abismo, donde un día cubicaron mis latidos. Te recuerdo abriendo en busca de mí, y luego, al olvidarte, no hay cajas ni chalecos, y desnudos nos paseamos al igual que el día cero, cuando fuimos menos. Y de regalo obtuve el crujiente sonido de mi tanque corazón. From my velvet genies. Genies stepped down with magnificent desires, hundreds of the old compress us, stunt the astute becoming. We do not hear the screams, however, within you I can see them. On the shore of my oceanic world, flashes rush over me. Your smile finishes far away, always. The lighthouses of neon smile about the crossroads. Shining, my heart is in pain with ice that burns it slowly, and I do not die because the soul has reached the bottom of the abyss where one day my heartbeats were measured. I remember opening in search of me, and then on forgetting you, there are no boxes or vests, and nude we stroll just like the dry, just like the day zero, when we were less, and as a gift I received the crushing sound of my tank heart. Fiesta de fantasmas. De mis moléculas tibias vienes a nacer. De mis lunas apareces. Luna repartida, hermana. Desde mi nombre en desenvaino la espada. La abro con cuidado de hada, solo para observarla. ¿Será que en algún momento deba activarla? Tu nombre desvanecido surge a la vera del camino. Una ruta sin vereda ni definición verdadera. Libre del despilfarro de aquello codiciado por tantos. Algo vacío que se piensa por lleno. Vengo llegando de una fiesta de fantasmas y ninguno se parecía a ti. Estos eran de venganza de tristeza, de lo no comprendido, pero tú eres diferente. Solo hay una cosa entre ellos y tú, solo una cosa en común y en donde se conjuntan por instantes y no es realmente una cosa, es una molécula de afán y afable intención. Lo seriamente común entre los fantasmas y tú soy yo. Ghost party. 
From my lukewarm molecules you are born. From my moons you appear. Moon shared, sister. From my name I unsheath the sword. I open it with the care of a fairy. Only to look at it. At some point should I activate it, your faded name will surge on the edge of the road, a route without pavement nor true definition, free of pilfering of what is so desired by so many, my, an emptiness that thinks itself full. I come from a party of ghosts, and no one looked like you. These came from vengeance, sadness of the not understood, but you are different. There is only one thing between them and you, me. Thank, Thank you, Indran. Hughes for all. Bye. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Pauline. Wonderful to have your work with us in this issue. Um, we're going, we have some strong poets to continue. And um, really, we're very thrilled with this uh, Susanna case, who gave us the gift of, uh, I think, eight poems, which is a record. Uh, in Beltway, and uh, and so let me introduce the New York City-based poet Susanna Case. Go ahead, Susanna. Thank you, Indran, and thank you, Sarah. And these two poems are from that series that was in Beltway, and that series is part of a book-length series about the death of a young woman who was collateral damage uh, from the illegal and covert activities of the FBI in mid-century under uh, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, who targeted uh, anti-war activists, feminists, Black Panthers, indigenous rights activists, civil rights activists, and so on. So, this is the um, introductory poem, and then I'll read one of the others. This is Woman Speaking Distinctly. If your flame licked, chain nicked, does it mean you like playing with fire? All kinds of things spin out of control, hires end in burned torsos. If you think it's enough to be the country's sweetheart, you might be surprised when you're suddenly not. In that turnaround, you could make book on being watched and make your plan. The only way to avoid the stake on which you die the way to rise above the blaze. You can see the Joan of Arc uh, analogies there. Uh, this next one is the fourth in the series and it introduces one of the major characters, other major characters besides the dead woman, the, a, a, a New York City detective. And it's called, the title is The Detective Can't Sleep. If he smokes too much, maybe he won't think too much. So here are the Marlboros, and there are the backup Marlboros, and here are his teeth, a yellowing, broken up roadway of too many cigarettes. He's thinking about a pigeon grazing nearby, a cooing ruin, how every trash pigeon in New York City is descended from a banded homing pigeon that didn't go straight home. Nights, he tosses, sweats, it's the D-ball, steroid for weightlifting. It's the rust-colored stain on his bedroom ceiling that looks like a fish, one with no insides, like the drawing a child makes. But there are no children playing here, his woman not looking at him fondly. It's the dead that keep him awake in a crowd, like today at a double feature of the gorgeous, grotesque hovering noticing something not right thank you that the, the book by the way will be out next year from broadstone books and it's titled the damage done wonderful after a double feature how did that line go a double feature <laughs> well you know <laughs> susanna obviously is a poet we dearly uh, care for very deeply deeply um also uh, broadstone is a happening press you know you Check them out. Uh, Mervyn Taylor published a book with them recently, and uh, and Sarah also has published with them. Sarah Cahill, Marilyn. and and you maybe right? Possibly now in yeah. the future. I I'm in negotiations. So now I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, so now we're going to hear from a dear close friend. He's, he lives in Silver Spring, but he's a Bronx 
poet uh, originally and a long time um, sort of mover and shaker at the Smithsonian before he, he left that gig to concentrate on, on his poetry full time. A wonderful musician as well. Have a look for his music um, and, um, and just very happy that to have his work in the issue. Terence Winch, go ahead. Thanks, Indran. And uh, thanks to you and Sarah for the magazine and for including me in it. I'll read um, two of the poems that are in the issue. The first one is called uh, At the Museum. They keep the 14th century on the lower level. Then they work their way back up through slavery all the way to 2017. Elevator time travel wears you down. I go in the opposite direction up where they keep the old suits and guitars, the sitcom scenes, the miraculous blasphemies that inspire us all. But pretty soon, I've had as much as I can take of all this anguish and heartache. I walk to 14th Street. I crave pizza so bad. I wonder if the pizza place I used to go to years ago is still there in the food court. Then I'm reading the New York Times and eating my slice. The news is bad. The pizza is great. All travel is time travel. I'm leaving town on Thursday, but I'm returning in the future, which is now, oh, you who are hearing this. And uh, this one's called Harbinger. I told the old people at the party, I wouldn't go with them on a long ocean voyage to meet the deities of the ancient world. They said unto me, nobody even asked you, pal. They didn't have to be rude, but that's the kind of old people they were. I knew they were in search of eternity, which I also knew would find them soon enough. My friend gave me a rock. The rock is white and beautiful. I think it may contain a spirit of some kind. I think it may be a talisman or a harbinger, both of which I'm always on the lookout for. I also like shells, their emptiness, their acceptance of abandonment greatly appeal to me. I would like to wash up out of the ocean like them someday, bleached white, upturned like a cupped palm, beseeching alms. Thanks. Oh, marvelous. I too Thank you. like to wash up on the ocean, bleached white, upturned. Uh, those are lines to be written uh, inscribed on a stone somewhere in, in a certain country we, we both love. <laughs> Perhaps uh, in that, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> a certain country? Let me yeah. see. Um... <laughs> well, you have one choice. <laughs> I do? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Ireland, Ireland, <laughs> Ireland. Come on, come on. Okay, I know, I know. I'm Here just kidding. Go. All right. Thanks so much, Terence. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. A little bit later on, we have another Irish poet, uh, also a New York, former New Yorker, Jonathan Harrington. So Jonathan, hang on, hang on tight. You're not next though. So I just wanted to say the, the you know, the, what's, what's coming down the pike. We're, we're, but, but right now we're going to, let me just check my list. I'm, um, I'm now I'm having a, one of those senior moments. Uh, let me see. Oh yes. I, Forgive my comment about senior moments. It's really uh, inappropriate to speak like that. So I'll drop that language henceforth. Um, let me call it a junior moment. Anyway, next, Alexis Levitin. Alexis is a translator. He has translated more than 40 books. He's, he's a hard worker, this guy. And he translates from Portuguese, from Spanish. He's a legend really in the world of uh, literary translation. I'm very pleased to have his work. Uh, this time reading from the Portuguese poet, Rui Bello. Go ahead, Alexis. Thank you very much, Indra. And I, it's a great pleasure to be part of this program. And it's a great pleasure to have joined uh, the Beltway, uh, the Beltway group. Uh, and I believe there are three or four Rui Bello poems in this issue, but I'm only gonna read one of them. Let me give you a little background. Rui Bello got a PhD at the Vatican. He was a deeply, deeply religious young man. 
he uh, it, it was very hard for him to extricate himself from theology and uh, and escape into well a real world where he, he he fell in love with a woman he married he had children he swam in the sea he lived on this earth and he died quite young uh let me say it that uh, uh uh he was even a member believe it or not of opus dei in his youth and um they didn't want to let him go but when he fell in love with teresa he had no choice and he fled and he had to hide out for a couple of years one more thing about him at his funeral he was a big man and a fat man at his funeral a welder had to come into the cathedral in lisbon to weld together the coffin that Rui Bello had burst open right there as they were trying to bury him. Okay, through rain and fog. I'm going to read it in English and in, in the translation, and then I'll read the Portuguese, and that's it. Through rain and fog. It was raining, and I watched you enter the sea far from here and long ago. Oh, my love, your gaze, my gaze, your love. Later I looked at you and didn't even know who you were. Now here I remember and I ask, what is the reality in all of this? In the end, where is it that things go on? And how do they go on if they do go on? Will I only leave behind bottles of pills, a lived in house, my name in the town registry, a remark in my first school book. It was raining and I watched you enter the sea. Oh, my love, your gaze, my gaze, your love. What difference does it make if somewhere else you go on? Everything died. You, I, that time, that place. What can I do now about it all? Maybe merely say, it was raining, and I watched you enter the sea, and I accept irremediable death for everything and everyone. Através da chuva e da névoa, chovia, evite entrar no mar, longe daqui há muito tempo já, o oh, meu amor, o oh, teu olhar, o oh, meu olhar, o teu amor. Mais tarde olhei-te e nem te conhecia. Agora aqui relembro e pergunto qual é a realidade de tudo isto. Afinal, onde é que as coisas continuam e como continuam, se é que continuam? Apenas deixarei atrás de mim tubos de comprimidos, a casa povoada, o nome no registro, uma menção no livro das primeiras letras. Chovia, evite entrar no mar. O oh, meu amor, o teu lugar, olhar, o oh, meu olhar e teu amor. Que importa que algures continuas? Tudo morreu. Tu, eu, esse tempo, esse lugar. Que posso eu fazer por tudo isso agora? Talvez dizer apenas, chovia, evite entrar no mar e aceitar a irremediável morte para tudo e todos. Thanks a lot. Muito obrigado, caro Alexis. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to invite... Uh, Jonathan Harrington now, because, you know, Jonathan is actually receiving an award in Mexico this afternoon. And so he has to leave by road to, to go and receive it. He lives in Yucatan. He's been there since uh, 2001, right after 9-11. He can tell that story if he wishes. And uh, he's a wonderful poet, translator, a novelist, and um, also a, a former New Yorker. Not that I have any prejudices in that regard. Um, Go ahead, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Indran. Uh, coming to you, Jonathan Harrington, coming to you from uh, Yucatan, Mexico, uh, where I have lived for over a third of my life now. 
I had the great fortune of meeting an incredible person in Pachuca, Mexico. Uh, his name was Indran Amirthanayagam, and uh, he, I am for right now, thanks to him, at this reading. And I'm very pleased to be included in the uh, newest issue of Beltway Quarterly. It's a wonderful quarterly, and, and it's uh, a real honor to be included in that. Uh, it's a special day for me because today I'm going to receive the Medalla Internacional de la Cultura y Arte here in Mexico, the International Medal of Culture and Art, uh, which is being given out by uh, uh, the uh, Presidente of uh, a place called Teco. And uh, so I'd like to read uh, to right now a poem for my latest book, uh, which is called Lift Up the Stone, uh, the Gospel According to Jonathan. I have rewritten uh, the Gospel of Matthew in more modern terms, including the current situation in the Middle East, uh, particularly in Palestine and Israel. Uh, but this, uh, the, the, I think it's fair that I'm rewriting the Gospel because all of the authors of the Gospel rewrote somebody else's stuff. None, none of them were witnesses. Uh, this one's called the 13th Apostle. In the Gospel according to Jonathan, there were 13 apostles at the Last Supper. The 13th Apostle. No dog has ever been as blessed as me, lying beneath the table at your last meal. I licked your sandaled feet and you scratched my stomach with a strap behind your heel and fed me scraps of bread and meat. I'm not remembered in any of the books, not Mark, nor Luke, nor Matthew, not even John. I suppose they didn't think that dogs have souls, but I was there. I'd sniff the double agent out. I could smell betrayal on Judah's feet. I tried to warn you with a bark. I think you understood, but you ignored me. And so I settled back and just enjoyed your sandals rubbing gently on my belly. One more, this one from, uh, uh, this one from my book, uh, A Key, uh, which is a bilingual edition uh, with uh, tra 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 translations by Fernando de la Cruz. Uh, I wrote this poem in, in Spanish uh, and Fernando de la Cruz uh, translated into English. So I think it's fair also, once again, uh, to read my version in Spanish and then, and then Fernando's version in English. Uh, it's called Protesta. Voy en contra de plantas que no florecen, de luciérnagas débiles, siempre en falso contacto. Voy en contra de ruido, groserías, basura y pilas gastadas, motores que no arrancan, de cerillos mojados, computadoras lentas, en contra de las lágrimas y heridas, del hambre y la sed, insomnia, envidia. Pero, señor, dijeron, ¿usted va en contra de todas esas cosas? ¿A qué partido apoya? Pues yo soy 100% y orgullosamente Miembro vitalicio del partido del amor. Protest. I'm against plants that don't bloom, faulty fireflies always blinking on and off. I'm against noise and rudeness, garbage and dead batteries, motors that won't start, wet matches and slow computers. I'm against wounds and against tears, against envy and hunger, thirst, insomnia. But senor, they say, you're against all these things. What political party do you support? Well, I am a proud 100% supporter and lifelong member of the party of love. Thank you. Oh my, you had to read a political poem, didn't you, Jonathan? I just Well, tried I'm to trying that. to get with the activist uh, mood of, of this uh, Beltway Quarter. Well, I mean, I read the poem about cats to begin, so 
We have well done, well done. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be with you, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. There, congratulations in, uh, there you are. on your prize. Jo Jonathan also writes reviews and criticism, and we are very happy that he's. Uh, uh, some of his reviews are starting to appear in, in the journal. And encourage yeah, send, all to, to send, send your books to Ingram and he'll send them to me. Okay. Encourage you to, to keep that section of the, the journal hopping as well. Now, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, 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 getting, I'm going to be writing a re review of uh, Samiri's uh, new book, The Five Legs of the Cat. Wonderful. S and Samiri Hernandez. We have a, a review coming up by him of Ji Won Choi as well. Um, I'm so delighted that in the room, one of our poets, one of the uh, uh, fine poet is joining us all the way from Australia uh, in the audience today, Dominic Heck. Thank you, Dominic, for being with us and, and joining uh, the party. Um, we're going to hear now from um, Angie Stan. Angie is doing amazing things for poetry and. Uh, and art around the world from her base in Italy. She's a German-born poet, painter, uh, visual artist, uh, videographer, uh, and um, founder of the project Rucksack, which is bringing poets uh, from around the world together, uh, meeting in, in installations in a museum in Italy and, and very much on the internet. Um, uh, a close friend, uh, a friendship born in this pandemic, and uh, grateful for all of the, her support. Angie Sten, go ahead, Angie. Thank you very much, Indra and Sara, for including me in this Beltway issue. And thank you for the introduction. And I'm happy to have here also two uh, members of the Rucksack Project. There's Dominique Heck, she, she is pa participating in the Rucksack, and Chet Norman, who left also as a rucksack poet. Um, I wanna read first the poem that you published in the Beltway, which is about uh, the terrible violence that never stops in Palestina, Colombia. And I was asking myself, what's the opposite of violence? Um, and this poem goes about this. Empathy is a learning path. Lucy is dead. She fell from a 12 meter tree at the beginning of our history. And we straightened up, believing to be rational, spiritual beings with a special place between angels and animals. Yet our hearts are a noisy local market. The children have their hands full of sawn herbs. They crush spiders and ants. They chase each other with stones and sticks. And as strong men, they skip diplomatic procedures. The grammar of confrontation act before the opponent does and notify it with a tweet. And um, the second one is a little bit more <laughs> about the neurotic feeling during the pandemic. Well, some people get depressed and stop moving. Others get always faster and faster, moving more and more. So I hope this will be over soon. And the title is Mishmash, which is a German word that uh, traveled to America, to, Eng to the English language. I love words that travel. I guess this Mishmash, that means mixed up. I don't know if you really use it, but I saw that it's in English, it existed. I think it's uh, Jewish um, immigrants uh, during the fascism, Nazi fascism brought it to America, this word. So Mishmash is something really you can't get out of this. To be efficient betwixt and between piles of dusty books, crumbled communication, crinkled mishmash duplicated on screens. I yearn for deadlines to transform blind activity into tasks. As long as they stay at the perfect distance, like perfect lovers, I hear Alexa's warm voice from the other room being bossed around relentlessly. She chirps today's recovery rate 
sings, then gives the weather report with the confident anticipation of things uncertain. Like the drainage canal beyond my balcony door, the moldy cheese in the fridge, your mother's health, the overdue bills, and the thousands who die in the sea trying to find a new life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angie. Uh, I don't know how you say muchas gracias in, in Italian. Grazie mille. Grazie mille. Grazie mille. Grazie mille. And now, um, <laughs> I'm so uh, pleased to, to introduce our next poet. Uh, Luther Jett has been a, uh, I mean, he's a he's a figure here that you cannot uh, deny. He's he's a mover in the world of the Beltway, but beyond that, he's a he's an honest, direct, and, and very moving poet, um, and has been for all the years that he's been writing. And I'm just so grateful that he's got a new book out, and uh, he's he, we published him uh, on more than one occasion in Beltway, um, and he too writes reviews. Um, Welcome, Luther. Thank you, Intern, and thank you to you and uh, Sarah for pulling this issue together. I will read the two poems that appear in uh, the current issue. <coughs> Hippo River. Acacia and olive trees punctuate the winter yellow veldt. In the garden of night, great slow beasts lumber up from the river to feed on thorns. We hear the dull boom of their vast, many-chambered hearts in the thick, velvet, dark. In morning, we find their scat, steaming piles <clears throat> under the lodge decks, though the beasts themselves have vanished among the reeds. Starlings <clears throat> heralds the sun ascending over dry hills. The most dangerous animals <clears throat> are not those of tooth and claw, whose claims are clearly marked. You may imagine yourself innocuous but the hippos the hippo does not see you that way her fantasies are sharpen sharper and you bear a deadly scent hippo river is a real place by the way it is in south africa it is a real river uh, and it winds very close to the border of South Africa and Eswatini, uh, formerly known as Swaziland. Here is a poem in which I dream of ice. There are rooms of people and more rooms and more people and we wait or something to start, dinner, a show, a sermon, a speech. No one is really sure, but everyone is certain that soon, soon it will begin. I have a plate full of food, or I stand in line to fill my plate, or I Look for a seat at a crowded table where a woman with a gracile face pauses mid-word, her voice choked, tears in the corner of her eyes. Her hands are soft, soft and warm. I read aloud a poem Perhaps it is this poem, and people in the audience murmur, shift in their seats, so I am distracted and start to parse 
my own poem question the choice of words mid word outside sweet covers the pavement trucks and buses slide a thin shell of ice forms over everything no one will be going anywhere soon soon but the woman's hands are still still warm thank you very much thank you so much luther really looking forward to the work upcoming what we have also from you in future issues. We're reading at the moment for the fall issue, um, which will come out in October. Well, we're reading also for the July, the October, the August issue, the summer issue, but we have quite a bit of work, but if, uh, if any of you want to send for that or the fall issue, consider it, uh, we can still have a look at it, yes? And um, I'd like to now turn, um, a little bit beyond the Beltway to a, a, a nearby city that um, is fabled in literature as well for various illustrious uh, writers, including Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, and that is for um, to introduce Mark Nastor, who lives now in Baltimore, uh, his traditional home, but he spent many years in New York, where he did so much in the world of poetry and also in the world of music. And uh, we're just delighted, flabbergasted. Uh, I mean, he's a very elegant poet. He, he knows the language, uh, the fine meanings of words, and and he shows that in his in his verse. Um, grateful to have your work in the issue, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Greetings, everyone, and thank you, Indran, and thank all of you. Um, I'm usually. Kind of isolated in the poetry world. Um, these two poems I'm going to read, one of which was in the Beltway Quarterly, are from a collection called Insurgentes Avenues. And um, the manuscript is not published yet, but most of the poems have been. I want to preface um, with one reference. Uh, the second poem I read contains a word that many people do not know. The word is gajo. Uh, I spend a lot of I spend a lot of time in Hungary, uh, where my in-laws, uh, ex-in-laws live, and um, of course, anyone going to Eastern Europe can notice the, the horrible discrimination against the Roma, the so-called gypsies. So, gajo is a term equivalent to Hawley in Hawaii or gringo in Latin America. It's the non, the non, Roma. Um, and there's an old uh, expression or fable adage, um, which I've always loved, uh, as, as the Roma are accused of, um, you know, being thieves and pickpockets by, the, by the, 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 the majority populations. And the expression is, sure, we may pick your pocket, but you, Gajo, you steal with the pencil. It's just such an amazing. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to read um, two poems. Can you find them here? Okay. Number 28, The Fog of Wardrobe. Shanks in an interlock, cluster cluck, get it? Bumper facet sets off regional catastrophe in aerial pinball hurricane tilt. Elbows gyrate pinwheel destruction, necessitate cleanup by simple irritation of weakened pressure point somewhere in nature, confirming for one's risible perceptions of value or near to its opposite. What circumstance brings down requisite shovel plunging from unseated atmosphere? Purity? Salted nimbus bears the water diffused about landscape and poised to drop its vapor weight elsewhere. Mass doesn't care for lineage interplay, disapproval by noise gate 
or anyone clearly published and perished. Lock of desire on obsession to output, faith in contrivance or wishing to label it something else, punk, manifest heavy as a slobbered on pedicured blow pop pocket rocket, yours in its criterion, yours in reactive response to its self, yours in nuanced weatherman speak with an anchor's retort to a red laser point. Where climate jokes pour in a fusillade of punchline, incremental globalized cataclysm follows. Wanting to apportion some blame to your deity? Go ahead, who's not asking? Security splats mail yourself back to hell. Second poem, number 33, this is the one in the quarterly. It's called Rates of Exchange. Markets expire in divisible syphilis, one that crosses as one body overlaps into the bulk of another. Mutual hunger bears crowd-sourced intelligence. Burn! Construct to moment of conquest. Backstory nearly equal in substance as flight of the decimated kinship makes clear. Exemplary that of its grandparents' grandparents, dunned by genetic remorse. So says who? Underestimate fault till state of undress. Volatile incursions into glory hole optimists gawking aside as if commerce commenced on skill sets to haggle even when prompted to try something else. List into Ur space in camera, eye hole mounts to a gooseneck in socket and asks to receive its little guest. After gut paralytic cross examination, ordinances plant themselves in the body. Those who claim owner space shrug police power and deftly dilute de jure from constituent in under plexi in rain of molten brass metal as brittle reflectors affix onto epaulets. Reiterating, Gajo, you were only adept at how to steal with the pencil. And as further pretender to right of resistance, you cannot imagine any of this even as it closes its aperture off into markets on autolytic overdrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Great to have your work here. You know, it's, uh, it's a become a very personal matter editing a journal because you become friendly going quickly with the poets and the writers included. And, and um, you go back into your, the data, you know, the, the Rolodex of your mind and pick up poets from, from the past and, and add them to the to the new Rolodex. I know some of you don't know the term Rolodex, but I still remember <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, if you need a, def a translation, let me know. Um, uh, anyway, let's, let's listen. One of our Rolodex poets, uh, if I may use that term, is uh, is the technical whiz behind all of this. Uh, Don Krieger, before we turn to the last three poets, we'll read Vizena Azam, then Sandra Yanon, and then uh, Henry Crawford, and then uh, uh, Rudra Moticher, and those, that's the order. But Don, did you want to say any words or share a poem? Uh, thank you. It's, it's such a pleasure and a, and a privilege to be here and, and hear everyone. Um, I would like to read one, actually. Um, I don't know how to do this. Let's see here. Sorry for the delay. That's okay. I. Um, it's uh, ironic that the technical whiz is having a delay, but that's all right. We'll we'll forgive you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this was on go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, here we go. I've, I'm reading this poem everywhere this week. Uh, Memorial Day, it's an American holiday. 
It's the hundredth anniversary of the events I talk about in this poem. That familiar comfort. The river at Port Chicago was pink in the dawn glare. Strangely like that night, they fled for their lives. Biplane spotlit by burning buildings, kerosene bombs bursting on the roofs, clubs and rifles, white boys and their fathers, beasts hunting little Africa for black runners. Do you know this story? The Tulsa pogrom of 1921, 6,000 black people jailed, no whites, the Greenwood ghetto burned to the ground, no insurance ever paid, no crime ever charged, the dead uncounted. I never knew it till today, I bear that shame, small price for my privilege. From this day, I forswear that familiar comfort, the cowardice of forgetting. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Uh, it reminds me, you know, when we, celebrate, when we remember 9-11 in the United States, in Chile, they remember 9-11 for a different reason, the overthrow of uh, Allende and, and uh, the democracy there by Pinochet. So each date has its, uh, its memories for, for different people. And if we can all come together and include them, all of the memories in one and collectively remember, I think we will be better off. So thank you for that poem. We talking about memory and remembering. I mean, I'm very, very pleased and proud to announce the next poet, Zaina Azam, a Palestinian poet, who writes in English, but also in Arabic, I, I believe, some poems. And um, she has a new book out, and we're thrilled to include a couple of the poems in the issue. And um, Zaina is, is, is a poet I met in, on, on the stages of the Beltway and uh, grateful that her work is in the issue. Zaina Azam, would you go ahead? Thank you. Thank you so much, Indran, and thank you, Sarah, also for, for all the work you do for the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. I'm really so pleased that you put my poems in there, you've published them, um, and um, and so I'm going to read the two poems in the latest issue. And as Indran mentioned, they both come from my new book. It's called Baina Baina In Between. It's published by the Poetry Box. Uh, Baina is the Arabic word for between. And Baina Baina together um, connotes betwixt and between. So the two poems that are in the poetry quarterly and in the book are, um, the first one is Syrian refugee at the dental clinic. Just a little bit of a backstory. This is a very short poem, by the way. Um, the, there was a, a group of Syrian refugees that um, who came to Northern Virginia. They were resettled here a couple of years ago. And I volunteered to, um, translate from Arabic to English um, and vice versa uh, for this group. They were getting some dental care at a clinic. So I met this young woman there. I, I actually changed her name. Um, Syrian refugee at the dental clinic. Iman from Hams is 20 years old. At 13, she married and got pregnant with the first of four children a broken tooth and three cavities, baby on her breast, mouth wincing in pain. Iman never learned to use a toothbrush to clean her accumulated tar, plaque, or microscopic bits of food left over from her journey a month ago. Maybe that's why she clenches her teeth, 
to keep the taste of home. Um, in, in my book, actually, I talk a lot about home and the idea behind Bena Bena is, is all the places we find ourselves in between things, between home and exile, between two cultures, between two languages. Um, the second poem was actually written with the prompt of how does technology affect us and how, how do we interface and how is it changing our lives? This is called Traveling with the Speed of Light. News from Damascus scrolls on TV, a morning chat with a friend just home from work seven hours in the future. My hands can almost touch the cyclamen on West Bank Hills as if tending flowers in my backyard. The Corniche Road winding around Beirut's tip, hugging the sea so close to my doorstep. As world wanderers, we click on screens, sift symbols, look with sister eyes and oval lenses of intersecting circles, the radius of the voyage invisible. Stories between ethereal mouths and ears, voices and bits and bites penetrate thick mountains, deserts. We measure epiphanies in seconds, move on, leave unintended footprints. There are dreams of tented trysts, shards of conversations, mistakes, maybe second thoughts, deleted. Like dense coffee grounds lining once welcoming cups or small bowl bowls of dull olive pits, a sadness. Only scintillas of thoughts linger, a salty taste in memory. Now in Washington, a white moon blooms while the sun throws rays on Jerusalem and Amman and this luminous language of loving. Imaginary lines around the globe, a curving cage of messages at the speed of light. We reach out, draw in, close as the space between fingers on a keyboard, far as the great meridian from pole to pole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zeno, and many congratulations on your new book. I know it's been a long time coming and we've been waiting for it for a long time. So let's, uh, let's send the word out uh, widely, you know. Um, we now have another Palestinian poet on the American stage joining Naomi Shiab Nye. Welcome. And, uh, now I'd like to, to go on. Uh, we are down to two or three more poets. And really, it's hard to finish a reading like this because they're all uh, very special, every one of you. But, you know, Sandra, <laughs> I have to say, is special among the specials. I mean, she, uh, she's an amazing worker for poetry. I mean, her Cultivating Voices Live series is, is global. And, and and it's intense and it's and and it includes thousands of poets now and and good ones and uh, her work uh, her own work published by Salmon Press which is a, a major Irish by poetry press I mean I can't think of any greater honor than to be published by one of the leading publishers in Ireland if any poet uh, would uh, would uh, would give up their their shirt to to go to Ireland and, and have their work recited there. Uh, anyway, Sandra, a great poet and very really excited to have your work in the issue. Go ahead, Sandra. Well, thank you, Indran. It was, and of course, Sarah for uh, including, I was fortunate to have four poems in this issue and I've just marveled at the issue itself and, and hearing all the voices and poetry of a number of you that are also members of Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. Before I read two of the poems, I'm just gonna put in the chat our upcoming readings. Tomorrow, actually, we have uh, on Cultivating Voices, 
the 40th anniversary celebration of salmon poetry. Um, but I'll give you the whole kit and caboodle of uh, all the readings for the month of, of June, um, including tomorrow's last reading of May, the 40th anniversary, 40 at 40. Well, um, again, I'm so grateful to have uh, poetry in Beltway Poetry Journal quarterly. I was reminded that at the turn of the, the after the first inauguration of a person's name I never use, uh, I actually had traveled to DC and stood out in front of the White House as close as I could get, um, kind of to read poems in protest uh, and recorded myself. It was this weird harbinger of things that would come after the um, after the pandemic when I started cultivating voices in March, only weeks after I'd actually met Indran at AWP. Uh, so this first poem is pretty much, I'm gonna use that word, a mishmash. I love the word. <laughs> um, a mishmash of my love of the poet Carl Phillips, the pandemic, I will have a cameo by a cat uh, and uh, also hearkening back to some attitudes after the 2020 election. Probably the longest title of a poem I've ever, ever had. So here we go. Reading a Carl Phillips poem days after the 2020 election from an unread 2002 issue of the Indiana Review, I fall in love all over again. I know that litigation is never the answer, leads only to satisfaction, delayed gratification, the greater good denied. So what I crave now is air, that lacks viral intensity, who knew I could become socialized to so much distancing, like Carl Phillips' syntax, impeccable and inscrutable, all at the same scrambled time, and that which I've come to love, but never, quite never apprehend a feline language roaring always underneath the cat's purr, a claw injected into the center of my eye the moment I open to mourning, a pandemic shock to my system, overloaded, waiting to blow like a glass fuse. You never know when it, the fuse, becomes her or if she is worthy of such contemplation. You want, of course, to believe she is, but what you don't know is like the future remembered, a shirt worn inside out, a kiss given once now retreating, and you watching every frame of her face pulling away in slow, reverse while on your lips that evaporating inappropriate residue an ember of touch everything else the unrequited reflection of how when mitigated the lines break exquisitely into place and uh for my Second poem, also again, so grateful to have it in um, in Beltway Poetry Quarterly. Uh, you know, I there's just been too much violence um, directed against uh, African American men in particular, and this and as we are hearkening back to, you know, revisiting George Floyd's murder and the subsequent. Uh, and all the other murders that have happened far, far, far too back. Um, this poem emerged from that. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the television show, Law and Order, that's what I'm referring to in the title. 
why law and order will never be canceled. From the radio, a person impersonating a president speaks to a nation of matchsticks and toothpicks. What I mean to say is a residue of lunch nags between his teeth. What I mean to say is he embraces decay like sugar dappled on Kellogg's frosted flakes. What I mean to say is I miss mornings digging into cereal boxes for plastic prizes. What I mean is I worry about strangers when I go to sleep. What I mean is that I can't sleep and leave law and order marathons blaring all night. What I mean is I cannot listen to anyone pretending to be news. What I mean is I feel sorry for the bullets in their solitary chambers. What I mean is shootings are lynchings without the rope burn and snap. What I mean is around the necks of black men. What I mean is history is a smoke as deadly as any fire that I cannot see. What I mean is I turned off the radio months ago. Thank you so much to each of you for, for your significant and magnificent voices and keep them coming, please. And feel free to contact me if you have a new book and would like to come read on Cultivating Voices. Thanks, Indran. Thank you so much, Sandra Yadoni. Um, uh, delight to have you read with us and um, and yes, do contact Sandra. She's uh, she's just wonderful what she's doing. Now, uh, my pleasure is to introduce to you. We have we have two more poets. Um, the penultimate, and uh, certainly not the penultimate in terms of uh, the strength of his work, is uh, he's a wonderful poet. And he's also a a, a a person who presents poets and in the uh, in the virtual world now, but also in in real life, um, Henry Crawford. Um, there's a series uh, in the Beltway area that's it's fabled um, to which he he is one of the key players there, uh, out of the Writers' Centre. Um, thank you, Henry, for sending us poems, and, and your the microphone is yours. Thank you, Indrin. I want to thank Indrin and Beltway for including my work in such a group of such august poets. Uh, well, as you can see, I'm in the Milky Way. And uh, more prosaically, I'm in Silver Spring. But I'm also a uh, pizza eating former New Yorker from Queens. I hope my county is uh, represented there. I'm going to do two uh, of the three poems that uh, uh, it were included in this issue. Uh, the first one deals with that time in life when we realize that childhood is definitively over. This is adulthood. I announce my leaving early, go upstairs to find my coat, a pair of stragglers in an alcove sneaking a smoke, a group of women talking by a wall in a room expanding in the dark. My gracious host, standing in the hall, appears lost for a second, skyward eyes searching as a child arrives in fire engine pajamas. Guys downing beers as a quarterback is looking for a receiver in the family room downstairs. People are glad I came. I, I've got my coat, the car keys. I'm given a slice of leftover cake. The car is down the block. Houses follow along the tree-shadowed sidewalk. Above us, the stars, each one a burning furnace. Thank you. And my next one is a, uh, an attempt to convey what it's like to be a page in a book. 
This is the crying of page 234. I'm just paper, pressed in ink, standing with others on somebody's shelf, years since anyone's opened me up. I wait for my chance to say what I know. It was an affair of the heart, nothing more. It was Jason Gladstone drew me in, his ebony eyes, his words imbibed. There were tales of travel, ports of call. And there was Jim, the forthright father, the husband I was prepared to abandon. Wouldn't you, dear reader, if given the chance to embark upon a life that's new? But now the page, my page, the one that I was meant to be, where I turned to kindly Captain Henry, a whaler in his day, who knew the ways of the fickle sea. The ancient skipper leans back in his chair, takes a soft pull on his blackened pipe. Then halfway down the paragraph, I know, there'll be no taking Jason for my Jim. So how does one leave a once loved page? Darken its days, perhaps forever. As the captain says down near the bottom, let it go, my dear, let it go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Henry. Let it go, let it go. Yeah, I would like to write that sometimes about various things in my life. <laughs> but anyway, one learns to let go. That's what growing up is about, I think. Um, and one learns to receive as well, to let for it to come back. You let it go and it comes back to you. And that's one lesson I've learned from this pandemic. I've been lucky enough to survive it thus far without any too many scratches. But listen, we are look, talking about letting go. I, I can't believe a more symbolic finish to the reading than a reading by Rudra Murti Cheran, who is a, a dear friend and from the old country, from the country of Elam, the country of, of Jaffna, the city of Jaffna from the north and the south, because we met in Colombo in that island in the late 80s, um, when we worked together on translating a poem by Sivaramani, a, a young Tamil poet who, who sadly took her own life and uh, left uh, the few poems that she left, which were compelling poems. and. Um, Sharon uh, is a professor of sociology. Um, he's a poet, he's an essayist, and uh, his work is available in English from um, various presses, uh, uh, including um, Mawensi House in Canada. Um, Rudramoti, Sharon, go ahead, Sharon. The microphone's yours. Thank you, Indran, and thank you, fellow poets. And it's a great opportunity. I must admit that I, I do not write poetry in English. I write uh, creative nonfiction and plays and all kinds of academic stuff in English. But when it comes to poetry, I write poetry only in Tamil language. So I would like to acknowledge the translators of my poetry. And the two poems that I'm gonna read from this collection <clears throat> in a time of burning, they were translated by Lakshmi my dear friend Lakshmi Holmstrom, Holmstrom. Uh, she passed away a few years ago. And the first poem is titled Sunset. It's about the last phases of the war, or more precisely, it's about the uh, end of the genocide, the Tamil genocide in Sri Lanka. The Sunset. The sun has set. The sun has set across the spreading fields. The sun has set. The sun has set in the shadow of the woods. The sun has set beyond the anger of the rain, which is yet to fall upon the hundreds and hundreds of muddies, sprawled upon the sand, upon the seaward leg, upon the seaward leg alone, upon the seashore. The sun has set upon the broken wings of a quivering small bed, which does not know where to heap its loss and sorrow and searches for a corner in a small cage 
where it can lurk within my tears, the sun has set. The sun has set within my tears. At dawn, they arrive with faltering wits. The body has not been found. My second poem is titled, <clears throat> uh, the, this is an old poem actually, it was in, I wrote it in 1995, the beginning of my uh, exile in, um, in, in, in Toronto. Ask, ask the snakes how to copyright. Ask the morning how to dawn. Ask the sleep workers what color the dreams are. Ask the refugees how their tears became their prison cells. Ask women and blacks who must walk the streets of this town at night. What fear is? Ask the lovers who were, who were no studs. Whether the last last for only 30 days. And ask the man soon, where the fish have all disappeared, the fish which once sang in the still milk ocean beneath the bridge on full moon nights. Ask the lost diaspora. Ask my lost diaspora, what is born out of the loneliness of language. Ask her who flung a living ember of fire upon the ice cliffs of my life about the quintessential loneliness of grief. Ask her and ask her. And finally, you ask me when the last train of the evening has gone and the railway line shiver and break in the cold, what it is to wait with a single wing and with a single flower. Thank you. My God, Jaren. They say in America, you killed it, you know? You made it grow. The tree is growing tall and furiously, thanks to your words. And thanks to everyone's words today. What a wonderful reading, what a wonderful finish. Uh, there must have been a reason why we met back then in the night 80s and why we are all here together today for this poetry. Thank you very much. We have now a few minutes uh, and we'll close up, but while we're still on Facebook Live and recording for posterity, is anybody, uh, would anybody like to say any any words at this time, comments, questions, and then we'll, in about five minutes, we'll go offline. Go ahead. Anyone, feel free, open your mic. and Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Indran. So grateful, Indran. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was, I was able to stay throughout. I couldn't be happier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gashin. Thank you, Mark. It's a lot of work to do a literary magazine. So yes, thank you both of you for the work you do. It's a lot of work. We're only as good as our last poem, our last issue. So let's keep it going and work hard for the next one. And thank you for spreading these words around. Um, Beltway, by the way, is, is also taken on a political tint, one, let's say. Uh, we've written a letter that's published and been spread by pen about poets being killed around the world in places like Myanmar and, and in, well, there are certain countries I mentioned, in particular Myanmar, where more than the, well, I yeah. talk in the letter of three deaths, but there are some 30. Um, go ahead, Pauline. Yeah. Or, anyway, just to let you know, that, that open letter, if any of you hasn't signed or wants to sign, just email me uh, and uh, we'll keep that circulating just to raise awareness about these, the precarious state, not only of selling books, but of losing your 
your flesh and your blood, your life in some places because of what you write. Um, and of course, it's not only poets, it's the human rights workers, it's the journalists, it's everyone protesting tyranny or dictatorship, wherever you find it. Other comments or questions? Or yeah, I want, want to thank Don. Go uh, ahead. Go ahead, Angie. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for the really touching poems. There were really strong poems that uh, will accompany me. And as you said, the pen uh, is working about these things. Since I'm in the German pen, I would like to propose that we could do things together, you know, to put things together, so organize internationally meetings about these uh, persecutions of writers, poets all over the world. Mm -hmm. Could be an idea. And then I wanted to invite everybody who is interested to ask me friendship and Facebook so you could enter into the Rucksack project, which is a complete international project with more than 250 poets from 58 different countries. So it's really a trip around the world. And you get to know so many realities. So it's um, everybody who could be interested, please ask the friendship and I will send you the call and you can participate. Okay, thank you. Uh, Angie, I think Susanna had asked earlier in the chat for the, the yeah. information about that. Yes, uh, I heard from Angie, thank you. Yes. She sent it to you, okay. Um, I'd like to add, add a word about the next uh, Saturday's lip balm. Um, it should be quite a show. Uh, we have Gary Snyder reading with us. Um, as many of you know, he's now in his early 90s and who knows how many times we'll get to hear him again. Um, appearing with Gary uh, Wong Ping, who's flying especially from St. Paul, Minneapolis to the Sierra Nevadas to be with Gary while he gives his reading. Um, and Alison Adele Hedgecoke and John Kinsella from Western, Western Australia and his wife, uh, also a great poet, Tracy Ryan. So it would be great if some of you would come and listen in on that day. Uh, it's Saturday, um, next Saturday at 5 p.m. Um, but I'm sure you'll see it on, on Facebook if you follow that. Thank you, Mark. I'll, I'll be ahead. there. I'll be there. I, I, heard, I heard Gary Snyder read 50 years ago. Denise Levertov brought him to, to MIT and he read there. And I've used one thing from his poems over and over again, 10,000. 10,000 means everything, it's infinity. And his, his, his poem, of course, 10,000 years. Yeah, great poem. Well, thank yeah, I wanna... you. Thank you so I much, Indra, Indra and Sarah, for hosting this fabulous okay. reading um, of, of very varied uh, writers from all over the place. Um, I hope the tradition definitely continues long into the future. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. If I could uh, just plug our next Cafe Muse um, online, it's going to be on June 7th, 2021. It's gonna feature Tara Campbell and Meg Kearney. Um, and uh, Meg do, Kearney, yes, She's great. I haven't heard from her in years. Oh no, she is oh. great. We would we did the rehearsal just yesterday, and she is a dynamite uh, poet. So, where, do you know where she is situated nowadays? Uh, I think she was up in New England. I and I always, you know, being a New Yorker, I don't know the difference between New Hampshire and Vermont, <laughs> yeah. but uh, it's one of those places. <laughs> Uh, yeah, she's up in New England though, and uh, she's great. I saw I heard her way back about yeah. thirty years ago. Yeah. Well, you'll have a chance to hear her on the seventh of June, and I'll put the link into the chat where you can register for that well, event. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, if there are any other comments or questions, uh, I think we'll go offline now. So, Don, would you... gracias, Indran, a todos. Yeah. Um, y me gusta mucho eh, conocer a nuevos poetas creo que ha sido un muy buen grupo así que los felicito a todos si quieres traduce Indran so yeah uh, Tolin thank you thanks everyone uh, she's very happy to have met new poets very good poets and uh, very grateful for this opportunity and and uh, this exchange 
Um, so just wants to express her gratitude to everyone. You know, you know, we're all suffering from the isolation of the pandemic, but I have to say that although on principle, I hate the computer, this uh, possibility of seeing people all over the world and being together like this is really pretty extraordinary. I'm very grateful for it. And that's why I wanted you to name where everyone was. For instance, the woman who's awaiting the birth of her grandchild. Uh, she talked about this country. She talked about a river drying up. But you never told us where she was. I, I am, that, this is Kashiana, Alex. Yeah. The, I am, this is funny. I'm moving, uh, I am from India. I'm in the, I live in the U.S., I'm moving from Chicago to North Carolina, and I'm currently in Boston by the <laughs> banks of River Charles, waiting for the birth of my grandchild. Okay, so <laughs> the answer is quite complicated. Right. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Thank I, you. I just wanted to add quickly how much I also appreciated, uh, of course, hearing translations and the ability to hear poetry in um, people's home languages. That is always quite um, extraordinary to have that opportunity. It doesn't always present itself um, in the different formats. And I'm, in, and I'm extremely grateful to have been able to hear um, multiple beautiful lyrical languages today um, from around the world. And so thank you, Indran and Sarah, for, you know, for bringing the world to us today exactly. in that regard. That's right. Thank you to all of you. Look, talking about the world, yesterday in the mail, I received this book, which is translations of Eugenio de Andrade. He's a great uh, Portuguese poet into Shetlandic. Have any of you ever heard of Shetlandic? And unbelievable, it's the language in Northern Scotland near the Shetland Islands. Uh, and, and I never even knew such a language existed. And so this, uh, it, it's really exciting. It's uh, overwhelming. When, one of the reasons one doesn't want to die is because one has to give up all those languages. <laughs> well, Shetlandic is um, Scandinavian primarily. Yeah, it's very similar to Icelandic actually. Okay. Yeah. House in the rain. Husa idi rain. Rain once again. Rain ensimer. I'm just looking at, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's very exciting encountering the other, the various manifestations of Wonderful. the other. Yeah. Thanks well, a lot, Indran. That was terrific. The whole thank thing. You all, Alexis, thank you all. Don, will you do the honors? Uh,